Uh, what we have here is a 2004-2005 Starex GRX. Uh, one of the last ones before the Grand Starex came out in 07, 08. And well, of course he came here because he wanted more power and looks like we can remap it. We're checking it now to see if uh, we can read the ECU. I remember that we were able to unit ship one of these things long, long time ago. <laughs> And after that, uh, well, no, nobody really tunes vans back then. But now, heck, you can tune a high ace. You can tune a NV350. You can tune, we can tune a Photon Thunder. Obviously, the Grand Styles we can tune. And it's nice to see something as old as this one that we can still tune. <laughs> well, looks like Puede because we managed to get the ECU identification ID here. So that basically means our Alien Tech software talks to the ECU. So. And there it is, that's the ID right there. So we got the hardware number, software number. So press OK, and it says proceed with reading. So that's also an OK. And it's reading the ECU. So that's already half the battle right there. If we're able to read the ECU, most likely we can remap it. So the next question is, uh, since how to open up the ECU and decode what's inside, uh, Alien Tech also has a piece of software to do that, which for something this old should be already in the database long time ago. So if it's a 2004 and it's practically a almost 20 year old car <laughs> oh well we've managed to open the file and interesting enough uh the driver required to open it is the same as a kia sorento 2005 2004 kia sorento 2.5 liter diesel so that just goes to show that uh hyundai and kia are exactly the same cars they're just different on the outside but mechanically everything's the same so the same engine goes into the accent rio saluto reina it's all the same 1.4 the 2.2 engine is found in the diesel is found in the tucson the sportage and the sorrento and the santa fe well that actually makes a lot of sense for if you're a car manufacturer and you because the engine and the architecture were meaning where the engine sits, how long is the chassis, the suspension, the brakes. These are the bits that are, when you develop it, it's next to impossible to change. I mean, you cannot make the engine, to say, this is the only space for the engine. Bay. You cannot make an engine bigger than that and expect it to fit, so it doesn't work that way. The suspension also, once you design that suspension, it has these two fixed mounting points. There's no other way for that suspension to, wave, to fit and there's no other size for that suspension except that distance so the bits that you don't see underneath the engine and the chassis even the brakes and how many studs the wheels are those are very very hard to change and next to impossible to change what is easy to change however is the styling outside and inside you can change how the fender looks you can make the fender wider as long as it where it bolts to the chassis, it's still the same thing. So if the stock fender goes like this, you can make a fender that goes like that. That's not a problem. Wheels you can change. So with a bigger fender, you can just have a wheel with more offset to come out. So that's not hard also. Bumpers obviously are made of plastic. They're easy to design, mold, and change. Again, but where it mounts, the screws that mount it, the clips that mount it, those cannot change. But overall, you can change the look. Tail lights are easy to change, headlights are easy to change, interior is very easy to change. You want a new seat, just order new colored leather. So now you get the idea that you have one common architecture that underpins, say, six, four, four to six different cars. Then you can spread the development costs of those among six different models to target six different kinds of buyers. So exactly what Hyundai and Kia did with the uh, Accent, Rio, Saluto, Reina, missing two more to an, ex to an extent oh uh, to an extent the Veloster also shares the, shares the same architecture as this and the Elantra and the Elantra shares something with this one so again development cost is spread out anyway what we're doing now is we're tuning the car right now uh, tuning is basically what we see here we're ch changing the values here so it's called remap because this entire thing here these are called maps so let's pull one up system boost PSI so it's a matter of taking the, these numbers here and changing it well, maybe not that one 
uh, there it is the correct one where it shows it all the way from idle up to 4700 rpm we're highlighting everything and to increase that value uh, by the way the value being increased here is arbitrary meaning that let's say here this one uh, 1726 it's not 1726 pounds it's not inches kilograms nothing it's just an arbitrary number so what you're actually paying for when you do a remap is not the, it's not the actual clicking the plus and minus symbols just to make it bigger or smaller it's paying for the brains to know what to click how much to adjust just like when you go to a doctor you're not paying for a five minute consultation you're paying for the experience that he has that gives you a five minute consultation same thing and on the flip side, there are some people that are major philosophers. Then, but it's not like you're not going to eh? Why you charge so much? Okay, fine. I'll use the computer. I'll give that to you. Exactly this one. Here you go. You have all the maps there. I'll sample you one map. I'll do the adjustment. You do the rest. Then you load it to your card and see if it starts. If you break your ECU, it's not our fault anymore. All right. Adjustment is done. So. We're going to be doing our baseline. We haven't done the baseline, so uh, we're doing something a little bit different here because we didn't know if we can read it, if we can remap it. So we read it first, we did the adjustment, and we're going to do the baseline now. So let's go out and see what kind of horsepower this thing does. Not bad, the results are not bad at all. <laughs> so this red line is stock, so 80 horses, oh well. It's a 2005 diesel. I believe when these things came out, the engine was rated around 110, 115, so that's about right. Uh, then after remap, it's this green line. So here at 2000 RPM, we went from 35 to 75, so times two. Basically, we doubled the horsepower here. Uh, at 2.5 we went from 45 to 80 almost 85 so 80 percent more 60 to 80 65 to 90 uh, peak power is from 80 to 97 so but then again it's already at 3500 and it is a stock car with a stock exhaust so like with every other diesel after it reaches peak part around 3500 it all falls down so that's what happens with the remap also it just follows this graph here but what's important is this thing here at the bottom at a low, very low 2000 rpm where you wanted to spend 99 percent of your time this is where you want the power and the torque also in went from 120 to times two 120 to 240 newton meters and it's at a very low 2000 rpm and you have a lot of you exceeded that your stock peak torque is only 160 here so you have a lot more after so before you just really step on it to get the torque where you want at 27 3000 now at 2000 you have all this torque available to you so what that simply means is that konting tapak lang malakas na sibat and because you step on the pedal less unconsciously you actually let go of your right foot. So you step on it, uy, matulin. You unconsciously just let go of it. That is where 
and why you get about 8 to 10 percent better mileage because some people can't wrap their head around it if you're remapping and then you're adding fuel how in the world does it save fuel if you throw in more fuel but again these numbers are on full throttle but it will be the same graph if it's at 10% throttle, 20% throttle. So before, you used to step on the pedal as much as 30% to get the speed you want. Now you want to step at it at 15%, half the throttle. So less pedal equals less consumption. So that's where the mileage comes from, uh, the, the mileage benefit. So that's how you save fuel.